We're continuing our series of lessons on Jesus the Christ, getting to know Him better. Today we're going to be talking about His crucifixion and His death. Jesus said uh, in Matthew 20, verse 28, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give His life a ransom for many. You know, a key aspect of uh, Jesus coming to this earth in the flesh was to be that perfect sacrifice, that perfect ransom for mankind. That was the whole point of, uh, of the incarnation, the coming in flesh, being a man. Jesus did that, uh, emptied himself. We talked about last time, Philippians chapter 2, verses uh, 5 and following. He was there as deity, uh, living a spiritual uh, being in heaven for eternity. We talked about him being the creator of the world. And before the foundation of the earth, the plan for him to come and redeem mankind was indeed in place. That was his plan. That was him engaging in uh, this process willingly. And so he came to this earth in the form of a man, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for us. As we stop and think about that, not to be served, but to serve. If we want to be like Jesus, that's a quality that we're going to have to have in our lives. Servants. And we look around and we see people who claim to be uh, religious leaders, they should first be servants. Somebody who's going to be uh, serving as one of God's men should be willing to serve others. Yet we have in our world today people who uh, claim to be religious leaders who say, I need a bigger airplane because I can't fly with those common people. I need to have this. I need to have that. Those are people who look to be served. That's not Christ-like. The Christ-like person looks to serve others. That's what Jesus was all about. In fact, Jesus did it despite high personal cost. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Question for you. Did the Father enjoy the process of seeing His Son on that cross? Did that bring joy to the Father to see Jesus in agony, suffering, the brutality that He endured? No. But He did it for us anyways. He allowed His Son to endure those things anyways. Why? Because of His love for us. That agape love, that selfless love, that decision. You see, if we're going to be like God and we're going to love like God loves, we're going to have that agape love as a part of our lives. It just hurts me to the core to hear people say, well, I don't love my spouse anymore. What do they mean by that? I don't love my spouse anymore. The type of love we're supposed to have is a love that commits to them, that makes a decision. I want what's best for you continually. And if I don't love you anymore, that means that I've decided not to want what's in your best interest anymore. That's as selfish as selfish could possibly be. Do I love you? Do I want what's best for you? Oh, but, but my spouse doesn't make me feel like, like she used to. She, I, I just don't get those butterflies in my stomach anymore. It's not what I asked. That's not the question. You see, that's a selfish understanding of love. 
if we're going to love like God loved, love like he did when he sent his son, knowing he was going to the cross, that didn't make him feel good, but it was a commitment. It was for our best interest. So he did it anyways. And as we think about our love for others, it's not what I can get, but what I can give. Oh, but that might cost me something. Yes, indeed, it may. Look at what it cost Jesus. But he did it for us anyways. So as we begin our study about the crucifixion, the love of Jesus is paramount. The love of God for mankind is paramount. That's why he did what he did. And what did Jesus do? He laid his life down willingly. It was his choice. It was his decision. Notice the words in John chapter 10, beginning in verse 17. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. So as we understand the crucifixion process, we've got to realize that Jesus went through this process willingly. It was a decision that he made. Did he like it? Did he want to do this? Was this going to be fun? No. It was a horrible, cruel process, but he did it anyways. Why? Because of his love for us. And his love uh, in the crucifixion story begins in Gethsemane. As Jesus was there in prayer, knowing that he was about to be betrayed, Luke tells us that as he was praying, sweat drops as of blood were coming from his, uh, from his body. That's a process known as hematidrosis, uh, where the capillaries uh, near the uh, sweat glands actually burst. This is caused by somebody who's in a high stress situation. And, and the sweat begins to look like blood. You know, you mix blood with, uh, with another liquid and, and it looks like there's a lot more blood than there really is. This is not a huge volume of blood, but it would be a, a disturbance there in the skin. One thing that comes with that process, as, as scientists have, have looked at that and doctors have dealt with that, is it makes the skin incredibly sensitive. So as Jesus... Uh, went through that process for the next several days, his skin would be very sensitive to pain. And as he went through the crucifixion process, the pain would only be amplified by this process that began in Gethsemane. Jesus was uh, abducted by that uh, detachment of troops there in Gethsemane. Judas leading the way, and they bring him to the high priest. Now, the Jewish uh, legal system was very specific on exactly how somebody was to be tried, how a process like this would indeed happen. In fact, the, uh, the Sanhedrin would see capital cases like Jesus, uh, they would see that personally. You know, in our court system here in the U.S., uh, the Supreme Court doesn't hear cases to begin with. Uh, they're generally a court of last appeal. This is the final say after other courts have looked at, at, uh, looked at the case. But the Sanhedrin would see the capital cases themselves. They would act as the defense uh, attorney, the defending attorney, the, the Sanhedrin themselves would fulfill that role. And the accuser of 
the person who is being put on trial, that person would serve the role as the prosecuting attorney. In the case of Jesus, there is no prosecuting attorney. He's brought to the Sanhedrin at night when it was not legal for them to have court. And the Sanhedrin certainly didn't act as defense counsel for Jesus. In fact, they were prosecuting him. So Jesus is there going through this illegal trial. False witnesses come up in the trial. Now, if a false witness came up during a trial, the trial would immediately stop and they would deal with a false witness and convict that false witness of that which he was trying to convict somebody else of. None of that happened till finally the high priest is the one who made the accusation and uh, sent him to see Pilate. And Jesus was there as a Jewish man being illegally condemned by the Jewish leaders brought before Pilate, who uh, was the Roman proconsul, who is the only one who could authorize uh, the death penalty. He had several different choices that he could make of how uh, the guilty was to be punished, crucifixion being the worst of them. And notice the words between Jesus and Pilate. Begin in verse 28, John chapter 18. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, that, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would have not delivered him up to you. They didn't answer the question. Then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. You see, the Romans had taken that ability away from the Jews. And here the Jewish leaders are trying to use that against Pilate. That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. That would be the cross. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking of, for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Let's stop right there. Pilate said, I find no fault in him at all. Pilate, is Jesus guilty of a crime? No, he's not. Well, what would Pilate's legal and moral obligation be since he found this man to be innocent? Let him go free. But you see, Pilate was a coward. Pilate was a political creature. And he felt the political pressure from the Jewish leadership. We pick up verse 39. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber, a horrible thief. The other gospel accounts give us more detail on what he had done. A vicious, violent man. And they preferred to have him rather than have Jesus. 
You see, Pilate, rather than dealing with the situation directly, he found, finds Jesus innocent rather than just releasing him. Well, let me release, see if, if they'll take him as releasing this prisoner this way. When that trick didn't work, Chapter 19, verse 1, So Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. That was a vicious beating that would occur, not just a whipping like we think of a whipping, but they would include sharp fragments within uh, the whip itself. And as they pulled it across the flesh, it would literally rip the skin off the person's back. Scourging could be so violent that some people died from the process. The Romans work to perfect the practice so they could bring somebody just up to that point, close to death but not dying, in an attempt to make them suffer as much as they possibly could. That was the point of scourging. So Pilate condemned this innocent man to endure this horrible scourging, knowing full well that Jesus didn't deserve it. But he did it anyways. The soldiers picked up on it. They twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head. They put on him a purple robe. They said, Hail, King of the Jews. They struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns, the purple robe, and Pilate said to him, Behold the man. You see here, Pilate is trying to, to bring forth Jesus in this scourged state, brutally beaten, on the verge of death already, to try to gain sympathy for him. He had already been punished, allowing him to release Jesus, even though he gave him an illegal torture through the process of the scourging. Therefore, verse 6, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And he went into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Notice in Jesus' response, he said, You would have no power unless it was given to you from above. We read in Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, that Jesus is the one who created all power and all authority. Huh. So Pilate would have no power unless Jesus gave him the power. We see Jesus willingly giving himself up. Why did Jesus not answer? Pilate, when he said, where are you from? Pilate's now troubled. He's thinking he's in trouble with spiritual beings. He's a superstitious man. Uh, he could be in trouble with spiritual beings. And not just the Jews, but Jesus doesn't defend himself because he is willingly laying down his life for, uh, for us. At this point, Jesus could have said something about the, the trial process, the unjust trial process, not following the laws that the Jewish leaders were supposed to. He didn't. Didn't mention a word of that to Pilate. We pick up in verse 12. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. They're putting more political pressure on Pilate. If you allow Jesus to go, we're going to stir up trouble uh, with Caesar about you. We're going to see if we can't get you in trouble with Caesar because of releasing Jesus. Uh, this is blackmail at its finest. These people trying so hard uh, to put Jesus to death. 
And so Jesus was condemned to death by Pilate, the coward, the one who had found him not guilty. He sent Jesus on to his death. Jesus died. Where did he go? There's a misunderstanding by many that Jesus, when he died, went to hell. That's a mistranslation in several versions of the Greek word Hades. Hades, also sometimes translated grave. He went to the place of those who were dead. If you'd like to read more about this place, you can turn to the, uh, the book of Luke, chapter 16, beginning in verse 19. The account that we have, the rich man and Lazarus, not a parable. It's uh, an account of what happened to these two men and explains the situation where souls go when they died. And after this indeed happened, uh, Jesus was there in paradise with that, uh, uh, the one who was crucified next to him told him, surely you will be with, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's a section of, uh, of Hades, uh, the realm of the dead, uh, that's described for us there in Luke chapter 16. Why did Jesus allow himself to be crucified? It's arguably the most horrible, painful, despicable way that mankind has ever come up with to kill another human being. Jesus not only suffered the crucifixion, he suffered the scourging with his very delicate, uh, sensitive skin as a result of his struggles there in Gethsemane. We add these together and we see Jesus endured the most horrible death we could ever imagine. Why? Why didn't he just die of old age? Jesus was hoping and trying to help us to understand how truly horrible, despicable, ugly sin is. The whole reason Jesus endured this was because of sin. It's sometimes we don't take sin quite so seriously. It doesn't bother us like it should. Every time we sin, we need to go back to that cross. We need to think about what Jesus endured because of my sin. And that understanding should motivate me to change my life, to repent of my sins, to make a decision not to do that anymore. I'm going to quit that. Why? Because that's what made Jesus endure all of this. The cross should motivate us to avoid sin. Why do we need such an understanding? Well, to be honest with you, if there wasn't something that appeared to be pleasurable, sin wouldn't be a temptation. If we didn't find it, something appealing about it, why would we do it? We need to, in place of that which appears to us to be something that is appealing to us, we need to replace that with a cross. We need to replace, replace that with the suffering that he endured. And when I see that suffering, instead of my temporary pleasure, it helps me to avoid sin. It helps me to live the life that God would have me to live. So thankful that Jesus laid down his life willingly. The question is, will you lay down your life willingly for him? Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. 
don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And, that, and the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the roadmap to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.